Great, so we're starting to get folks um, signing in. All right, Tupac, I think we're, uh, do you want to give folks a couple minutes to sign in or do you want to uh, go ahead and get started? No, oh, we'll wait. wait. Okay. wait a bit. Yeah, we'll wait for a couple minutes. Thank you to everyone that signed in and yeah. uh, that's joined us for the NLG um, webinar today. Folks can submit questions. There will be, um, you can submit questions in the chat box uh, in the Q&A section. There will be time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar. Um, so Tupac will be speaking to us first and we'll have a chance to ask questions uh, through the chat. If you uh, are an attendee, you can also use the raise hand button um, that should be located uh, in your toolbox. So I hope that answers your question, Nikos. Great. All right, I think people keep filtering in. So do you wanna go ahead and get started? Just wanna welcome everybody uh, for, thank you again for joining us. Uh, this is the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery, Decolonization and Indigenous Self-Determination. Uh, We're so honored to have as our guests for the National Lawyers Guild Indigenous Peoples Rights Committee and Environmental Human Rights Committee joint webinar series, Tupac Enrique Costa, who is a founding member of Tona Tierra a grassroots community organization of indigenous peoples located in the Otham Javed territories of Phoenix, Arizona. That is based out of the Nahuacali Embassy of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, Tupac serves as the Yao Tachkao, traditional custodian for the indigenous Nahuatlaka community of the Kalpoli Nahuacalco. Thank you so much Tupac for joining us. I'm handing it over to you. Really looking forward to hearing from all of the wisdom you have to share with us tonight. Thank you. Take it away. Well, good afternoon, first of all, and I guess good evening as well. If there's folks joining us from the East Coast, no? I want to say that first of all, good afternoon and good evening. And with your permission, we would like to also extend our wish of well being that everyone is well, that everyone be well at the moment, at the time. Uh, this time that we're going to share together uh, through this technology of the Zoom, you know? And uh, if you would allow me, I would also like to acknowledge, just as I was coming back home to get on this webinar, the radio was on, and the governor was announcing the spike that's currently going on in what is known as the state of Arizona, the spike in the COVID-19 cases. And um, the dire nature of the reality that surrounds us you know in terms of the uh, virus that has uh, come to impact every single human being on the planet at this time. 
I understand that's why they call it the pandemic. The pan means, pan means sobre todo, above all and around all. And the demic part is talking about our humanity, all human beings, pan, all demic human beings, all human beings are being impacted by this uh, virus. Hmm? And so I wanted to, before we get into the content of this um, Zoom webinar, to acknowledge and recall all of the lives of all of the people who have in the last, let's say, the three months, we just came into the summer season, the Cuauhtonal. Uh, our introduction today, they told us that uh, we've been introduced as the indigenous uh, community representative, the, Cuau the Yautashko. And uh, on that behalf, we also want to say that because of that, we are called to acknowledge the time that we're in. I mentioned the pandemic as the environment that we're in, but also acknowledging at the higher levels, besides the pandemic of the virus, there's other systems that surround humanity as well. And fundamental to us is the Nahuatlaca people, Iscaloteca, who always understands ourselves to be enveloped and surrounded by, and, and is in fact a particle of the, the spirit of the sun. No? The spirit of the sun, which traverses across the, the heaven, the heavens. And just this past Saturday, we, we engage once again and emerge once again with the Kautanam, what we call the Eagle Sun, which in the calendar of the Gregorian is called the summer solstice. No? So I needed to put that in place because it's very significant for the message I'm about to give when we talk about the dismantling process is very important to acknowledge and weave into this understanding of the dismantling, the reassertion and the reaffirmation of the reality of the relationship of Mother Earth with Father Sky. So these points of cognition and recognition that are marked by the seasons are very, very important and fundamental if we're going to get through this dismantling process so that we don't get disoriented and dismayed into uh, into a, a, a despair that is not going to do us any good. So if you, with your permission, what I would like to do is uh, a call and recall upon all of those friends, family members and loved ones who in this past season, the past three months have passed away as a result of uh, being exposed to this virus and not having the immune system, not having a vaccine available to come through that. We've had a lot of folks that have gone through it, been exposed to it, and have survived it. We have lost a lot of folks too as well. I think in Arizona it's 2,500 people that have passed away as a result of the virus. And before we go into this um, Zoom webinar, I wanted to acknowledge this reality that we're in as part of the processes that we're hoping to intentionally engage through this conversation with you all through this webinar huh? and uh, if you wouldn't mind i'd just like to take that moment uh, to recall all those folks family members and loved ones who um, have been now and deceased now as a result of that exposure to the virus and um, doing that having done that it becomes important too to recognize for the purpose of this um, Zoom webinar, one particular individual I would like to bring to your attention, whose name was J. D. Yas, J. D. O. J. D. O. Begay, excuse me. J. D. O. Begay, he was the vice chairman of the Kokopa tribe and he passed away this past Saturday. I'm going to come back to him towards the end of this uh, webinar to recall a message that he left us of inspiration that I think is important for this um, for this webinar. No? So as we go forward, Natalie, from this point, I would also ask you to help us in the facilitation. If there's something that I'm covering or going through that you think deserves a question of clarification, please feel free to interrupt and facilitate that so we can move forward as best as we can no? through this next. Thank I think you so much. 
So, as you, as you know, you know this, I don't think, you know this without even having to be told, I think even the most, uh, the most uh, innocent among us, the child especially, you know, um, knows that uh, murder, murder is bad, it's very bad. Murder is very bad. But you can get away with murder. You, get, you can get away with murder if nobody, nobody ever brings you, if you're not brought to account for homicide, for being guilty of an infraction of homicide and actually physically doing it away with another fellow human being and going through a process of accusation, of presentation of evidence, some kind of proceeding that you could call a legal proceeding to where that issue, that case is brought forward and the community through their representatives, through their uh, authorities, takes that issue into account and brings out a mechanism to heal and to correct from that uh, act of violence against another human being, the taking of the human life, no? But unless that happens, then murder happens and it's bad, but the consequences of that towards healing or towards rectification or towards punishment as may be uh, ascribed by the community or by the legal system that the murder has occurred in, that could be left to the wayside, it would, might never occur. And in that process of bringing a case of murder to a, uh, an issue of murder, an incident of murder to a case of homicide, you know? now we're talking about the formalities of legal systems, of how such acts of violence are identified, how they're uh, described, how they're prescribed in the legal codes, and then how they're brought to rectification, to judgment, to correction, judgment, and uh, punishment if necessary, no? to be addressed. No? In the case of murder in the US courts, for example, no? and I think this is probably in many other courts as well, we have the term and the concept known as habeas corpus, right? Habeas corpus. From what I understand of it, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an attorney, but the idea of habeas I think, corpus. Uh, sorry, I think you got lost. Go ahead. The idea of habeas corpus, and you can help me out, Natalie, if, if you want to clarify, it means produce the body, you know? If there's a, a murder committed, you have to show the body to show that actually the person is, a death is there, you know, to be prosecuted, right? That's what I understand. Now, this is why when we come to address this issue of the doctrine of discovery, let's go ahead and do that, all right? Let's go ahead and address the issue of the doctrine of discovery, but that we don't have to do that, take very long to do that because everybody already knows what the doctrine of discovery is. You know it to some level, you know it to some extent, and every time you use the word America, I'm gonna repeat that one more time, every time you use that word America, and especially if you use that word America and you say, our country America, you're invoking the doctrine of discovery. You're invoking it. And why I say that is because we're talking about the fact that indigenous peoples, not to bring a case of homicide, but to bring a case of genocide against indigenous peoples in this continent specifically, we'll focus on this continent specifically. The issue of habeas corpus, you can extrapolate that into a collective scene and you can understand that it's the doctrine of discovery that has blocked the presentation of the evidence of why indigenous peoples are the victims of genocide and colonization for 527 years in this continent and it's been normalized by the psychological pathogen, I'm coming back to the idea of pandemic, the psychological pathogen that has been instituted in the legal system, in the political systems, and in the social norms of each and every country in this continent that is a successor to the doctrine of discovery through the papal bulls of Pope Alexander VI, 1493. All of this information, the core of it, the nuts and bolts of how it got produced, it's out there, it's been out there for a number of years now. The point is that if you want to know what the doctrine of discovery is at this point during this webinar, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to run back and catch up because we already got past that. Where we're at now in this webinar, we're not talking about what's the doctrine of discovery. 
We're talking about what's the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery. What's the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery? You know? And to get to that point, what we need to do is, um, is first of all, go through this initial process of uh, understanding um, how the doctrine of discovery impacts our daily lives today, how it impacts our lives in the local, in the regional, in the continental, continental and the global arenas, so, and how also, also continues to be the zombie doctrine. I call it the zombie doctrine that produces the continuation of the genocide of indigenous peoples, allows that to be normalized throughout the whole continent, now going on for uh, 527 years. Huh? So to get to the beginning of that story of how the doctrine of discovery becomes an issue for us as an Awathlaka, I have to tell you that um, we did uh, a takeover. If you do, if you come to the city of Phoenix right now, if you drive through the city of Phoenix, there's a highway that goes through, it's called I-10. Huh? It didn't used to be there, it wasn't there before. And when they were building that highway, they came across two sites of the ancient Autumn people, the original nations of this territory, that this is their traditional homelands, and they had settlements here, settlements of a, of a degree of population that were uh, great in number. According to what I'm told by the, the Autumn folks from the reservations that surround the city of Phoenix, the place was known as as a place of many houses in the Autumn language because of all of the settlements, houses, dwellings, and villages, temples that were here that existed and the canal system that still is in use. You know? So when the freeway came through here in the early 80s, the I-10 freeway, excavations were done on the archaeological sites that the freeway was exposing, that the freeway was desecrating. And at that time, it isn't like it is now. It isn't like uh, the situation now where the statues of Christopher Columbus are falling all over the place. At that place, at the time, it was considered just part of progress that this was going to happen. And in that process, the human remains that were in those sites were also being removed, excavated, and desecrated, and moved off to the reservations, to the museums. And in that time period, which was in the 1980s and 84 specifically, we saw what was happening, what's happening in our neighborhood. And we went to our friends and relatives on the reservation among the other, and we asked them, do you know this was happening? Were you aware of it? And there was some level of awareness among the bureaucracies of the tribal council, the state archeologists, the city, the, the state department of transportation, but the grassroots people, the traditional people especially, they weren't aware of it and they were upset by it. And we decided we can't allow this to continue to be normalized. We need to stand up. We need to do what we can. If we can't stop it, we need to do what we can to mitigate the damage that's being done to the dignity and to the spirit of the ancestors that are being removed and desecrated their human remains. So as a result, in the spring of 1984, in the spring of 1984, we did a takeover of the construction site of the I-10 freeway here in Central Phoenix for four days. The fourth day of that gathering was happened to end up on the first day of the spring equinox of that year, what we know as the butterfly sun, the, the time when the, the day, the night appear in even uh, equilibrium between one and the other. Uh, every year, twice a year in the spring and the fall. This time it was the spring of 1984. And when we were there, we had, had ceremonies, we had, had conversations, people came in from the four directions, from the different indigenous nations in the territory. And we sat and had council to discuss what was occurring, what had happened. And we understood that this was part of the same invasion, the same desecration, the same violence that had begun on October the 12th, 1492, with the initial invasion of the Nina Pinta, the Santa Maria, and the imposition of the, of the ideology of cultural supremacy 
that got translated into the white supremacy that we know so well today, that is the framework by which the doctrine of discovery has been, been normalized and instituted across uh, all the society, all the societies in the Americas and in Arizona, it was very, very evident to us that we needed to stand up and do something about it. What we did was we counseled with each other and we stood in a circle together and made a determination that we were going to fight back against the psychological attitude against the doctrine of discovery that had been emitted by Pope Alexander in 1493, the papal bull that created the theological basis for it, and against the political legal systems and economic systems that were derivatives of that, of that philosophy and ideology and that theology. We were gonna push back about, against it and we directed a letter to the Vatican from that four day gathering that took place here in the construction site of the I-10 freeway in downtown Phoenix, at the site of the excavation of the autumn uh, ancestral villages that was known as La Ciudad by the archeologists. No? When we're putting that message together, we stood in a circle and there wasn't a great number of us. There wasn't a massive number of people like you see in these demonstrations that are going on today. There was maybe a couple dozen of us standing there. And at one point, in the circle that we were standing with each other, the wind rose up. The wind rose up very powerfully and a dust storm enveloped us. For us to speak and to be heard, we had to shout our words, we had to shout our, our, our messages. And from that moment, from that event, the, the message that was sent to the Vatican, which was eventually responded, began a process that has brought us now to this event that we're conducting this Zoom webinar on the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery. Because they've set in process a motion for us, for our community as the Nahuatlaca or the Nahuacalco to take our place in the fight that had been going on for 500 and years at that point, that was before 1992. What we saw in 1984, we saw that, we saw that it was gonna be a necessary part of our plan to address the quincentennial celebrations that were going to happen on October the 12th, 1992. So in 1984, we started preparing for that. One of the things that we did was that we started mobilizing. We started informing each other about the root of the doctrine of discovery of the papal bulls of Pope Alexander VI. We started building an awareness about it. We started becoming informed and building an awareness about it. We started developing a consciousness about it. That got to the point where we had developed a critical consciousness about it. And what we'd like to do now at this point, if we can, is to share an outline of the methodology that we are using. I'm trying to share the screen now. Can you see that, Natalie? Um, no. It does say that you have started the screen sharing. So I think you just need to make sure that you're accessing whatever document you want to share. I can see it on my screen. It says I'm, some, I'm screen sharing. Okay. Everybody else says they see it. So you see it now? I see it. You see it now? Attendees can see it. Pardon me? Yeah, everyone can see it. I can't see it, but everyone can see it. So go ahead. This is where we come to from 1984 to 2020. We began the process of developing a methodology to dismantle the doctrine of discovery. And as I said, we started in 1984 at that gathering in the construction zone in Phoenix, Arizona, we began to move forward from there to engage and exchange with our other relatives about the significance of the doctrine of discovery 
and how it needed to be dismantled if we were ever going to have a chance to uh, exercise our self-determination as indigenous peoples. No? And the message that was sent to the Vatican in 1984 also began a process that uh, produced uh, a trajectory at the continental level that engaged the, the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery at the international level. When October the 12th, 1992 occurred, throughout the whole continent, there was an uprising that took place in, in, uh, in, in, in defiance and rejection of the quincentennial celebrations that had been planned by the Vatican, been planned by Spain for 20 years at the UN. And here comes a very important point to take into consideration. Spain and the Vatican had been organizing at the UN to have the United Nations celebrate the quincentennial celebration uh, as a jubilee. And they even took a resolution and had it passed uh, take it to take it to the floor of the General Assembly to have it passed to support that every single country in this continent has signed on as endorsers of that, of that resolution in support of the celebration of the Doctrine of Discovery. One of the most shocking things that we saw was that at that point, the United States of America was a signatory to that uh, resolution put before the UN and the government of Cuba was also a signatory to that. Every single country was a signatory to that. But when that resolution got to the floor of the United Nations for the UN to celebrate October the 12th, 1992 under, under a quincentennial global celebration, it was the African countries. It was the countries of Africa that stood up and said, no, 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 next you're gonna be having to celebrate King Leopold coming to Africa. You're going to have a celebrating the arrival of the European, European Americans in our continent, and we're not going to stand for that. So it got shot down. So in 1990, 1990, in preparation for that, October the 12th, 1992, there was a continental encounter that took place in Quito, Ecuador in 1990. The first continental encounter of 1990 took place. And hundreds of indigenous representatives from all over the continent arrived in Quito, Ecuador for the first continental encounter and made a determination that we were going to stand together on October the 12th, 1992 to reject that glorification of the genocide and colonization of our indigenous nations. We made a determination that we were going to begin the reformation of an alliance continental from north to south from coast to coast, across the entire continent, that we're going to reformulate under our ancestral principles of confederation as original nations. And we're going to identify that confederation as the confederation of the eagle and condor, the Kundur Anka. That was the emergence that took place in 1990 at the first continental encounter. And the activities that took place on October the 12th 1992 at a continental level where one of the outcomes as well was a result of that organizing where the people at a continental level with the information with the researching that they had done the consciousness that they had been able to absorb and develop into critical consciousness and reveal how the doctrine of discovery was still being normalized and implemented as a justification for the theft of lands the desecration of sacred sites and the genocide of our indigenous peoples was still uh, the pattern of relationship with the governments and the indigenous nations. We stood together and took a position in 1992 on October the 12th at a continental level in rejection of that uh, normalization of colonization and genocide. And we began the process of dismantling the doctrine of discovery in the strategic frames that you see here. We knew we had to start with ourselves. We had to start with our own families. And we got to the realization that just to get that to the beginning point of starting with our own families are gonna take us at least 20 years just to get to the beginning point 
on dismantling the doctrine of discovery internally with our own families and communities. So deep had been the impact of that doctrine in our different cultural realities across the continent. We knew that that work of organizing, going through the process of, of uh, the methodology of dismantling the doctrine of discovery with our own families was at some point, eventually have a reflection on our communities. And then within our communities, we would eventually begin to move the, forward, the process forward through our nations and through our confederacies. And we would develop a framework to move the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery forward at a regional level. With the idea, with the plan, that we were going to move that dismantling of the doctrine of discovery forward continentally and finally globally. This occurred in 1990 in its first phase at the first continental encounter in Quito, Ecuador. And after the first continental encounter in Ecuador, we returned home and began the process of organizing at the continental level to take on the longer historical task of uniting our efforts, coordinating our efforts in a strategic framework to accomplish the self-determination of our indigenous nations at the continental level, in alliance and solidarity with all of the other indigenous nations and peoples of Mother Earth as a whole. When we took that first stand on October the 12th, 1992, it was already understood that the self-determination and the liberation of indigenous peoples in this continent was inextricably bond, bonded and bound by our mutual commitments, not only with each other at the continental of this continent, but at the, hemis at the planetary level of all indigenous nations throughout the continent. As we began making those outreaches to the other indigenous nations from other continents to join with us as they engage in their own processes at their own in their own homelands, in their own continents to achieve what would be the final, the eventual goal of moving together strategically towards the decolonization of Mother Earth as a whole. So, 1990, we did that, and we decided to continue the process collectively. We gathered in 1993 for the Second Continental Encounter in Mexico, in a place called the Moya, among the Otomi. And there among the Otomi, the Second Continental Encounter was the second pillar that set in place the relationship as indigenous nations and organizations at the continental level to move forward with a level of strategic coherence to develop our capacity locally, regionally, and continentally to engage geopolitically, globally with the agenda of self-determination as indigenous nations. 1990, 1993, the two pillars of the first continental encounters were set in place. And this is an important reference to know because of the fact that as it is said today, it takes roots. Everything that has an existence today has a creation story. Everything that is a thing has a creation story. Everything has a history. There's a memory that's tied to it in human terms. And the history of the indigenous peoples movement continentally is rooted in our generation in these two continental encounters that took place in 1990 and 1993. In that process, and we were invited to participate in both of those events, we were asked, our organization, the Zona Tierra, the Nahuacalco, we were asked to step into that relationship building as an intermediary and as a bridge organization because of our capacity to be bilingual speakers and trilingual speakers in native, también español, castellano, with some versions of Portuguese, we became the communications link between the English North American brothers and sisters speaking their own native language as well, y los que hablaban el idioma castellano de los pueblos indígenas del sur. So as a result of that, we were called upon at a certain point to institute the Embassy of Indigenous Peoples, which is what this dismantling process has also produced. 1990, 1983, the two encounters, it took seven years. It took seven years to organize at a continental level to get to the first continental summit that took place 
in Teotihuacan, Mexico in the year 2000. At that point, at that point, we had developed a level of maturity to where we were able to institute a mechanism of our own making and of our own jurisgenesis to set in place a system of jurisprudence and a procedure of establishing jurisdiction so we can make, make our own judgments collectively on how we were going to advance continentally towards our self-determination, full exercise of our self-determination. That system of jurisgenesis, jurisprudence, jurisdiction and judgment is what we know as the Aryayala, the liberation of Aryayala. You know, I began this presentation with you making a reference to the term America, no? The term America. But you know, or you should know by now, that the term America is not, it's the colonizer's term. It's the term of, that the doctrine of discovery has normalized and established as a framework to control the allegiances of the constituencies of the states that are the successor states to the doctrine of discovery of 1492, the paper bulls 1493. So that by the time we set in place the Treaty of the Tihuacan at the continental level with the Jewish genesis, Jewish prudence, jurisdiction and judgment systems of our own making outside of the international legal system of the Western colonizing constructs, the Westphalian system of slave sovereignty, we, we removed ourselves from that constraint conceptual. We went off the reservation internationally and we became an international entity of our own design and making and began to reformulate our own international legal systems with obligations and responsibility that went all the way back down to our own families and local communities. And we call that the Aryayala. We call that the age of the Aryayala. We call that the liberation, the dawn of the liberation of Mother under the name of the Aryayala, under the identifier of Aryayala, which is a term that comes from the, the Kuna people in the central part of the country. Yala, Aryayala, on Mother Earth, in a full maturity, a mother earth in a full maturity. At the first continental summit in Mexico, Teotihuacan 2000, we put that together in the form of an international treaty, a framework of international relationships of our own making with ourselves, and we began the process of developing political solidarity, cultural exchange and complementarity, economic strategies of of, uh, of, of the continuity of our development as nations and also fundamentally grounded in the relationship of our spirituality, of the emergence of our, re-emergence of our spirituality as guardians of the caretakers of the well-being of Mother Earth and the future generations. And that's the foundation of that treaty that we came to know as the Treaty of Teotihuacan that was ratified at the first continental Congress in Mexico, at Teotihuacan, Mexico in 2000. In 2004, we moved forward again and returned to Quito to the second continental summit. And that was uh, once again, uh, another gathering of the continental level of indigenous nations and organizations. And since then, there's been five summits that have taken place in continuity of this process of dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery at a Continental Level. The Tihuacan in 2000. 2004, the second summit was in Quito, Ecuador. In 2007, the third Continental Summit took place in Ixinche, in Guatemala. In 2009, we went to the fourth Continental Summit in, 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 um, in, in Peru, in, in, uh, in, um, in the territory of the, of, the, of the Lake Titicaca. And the fifth continental summit took place in the territories of the Cauca in Colombia in 2013. And in 2013, the fifth continental summit where this process of dismantling the Doctrine of Ascrebi began has, be, has been maturing over the last 27 years or 30 years now, since 1984. Huh? Uh, 
the fifth summit, it was determined, we received a message from our sister, Berta Cáceres, from the indigenous organization of the Copina and Honduras. The word came in 2013 at the fifth continental summit from the Copina organization, the coordinadora, the organization of the pueblos indígenas, the Honduras, to Berta Cáceres sent the message, we need you to come to Honduras because we're under severe oppression, we're being eliminated, we're being exterminated. We need the solidarity of the continental indigenous movement. And so we agreed in 2013 to go to the sixth summit in Honduras. That was in seven years ago now. This is 2020. And so what has happened since then? What has happened since then, relatives, as you know, is that Bertha Cáceres was assassinated. She was assassinated. I think it was 2015. And the indigenous organization that she organized, the Copin, has also been under severe, extreme persecution to the point where the conditions to bring in a cross and bringing an, a continental sum of indigenous peoples has not been presented, has not been able to happen. And as a result, the, the trajectory has returned once again to a, begin, a point of beginning and re-emergence to where this year, in the year 2020, the process of dismantling the doctrine of discovery has moved forward to calling for a continental indigenous uprising in expression of self-determination and in defense of the territorial, territorial integrity of Mother Earth to take place in September. September, during the time of the butterfly sun, known as the fall equinox, the dawn of September the 22nd, the night of September the 21st. What is being called for now is for us to engage with each other to the degree that we are able to, even in the conditions of this pandemic, to engage with each other and to take strategic action in whatever way is possible, whatever way is feasible, whatever way is, uh, is, um, is um, realizable to make an expression continental, collective, and synchronized to make a reality of our self-determination known to the international community across the continent and across the world once again, as we did back on October the 12th, 1982, as we did at each one of the summits that have taken place since then. No? That particular initiative that we call the Iskali Abiyayala, the uprising of Abiyayala, has already had its initial, um, uh, 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 in initial uh, ac action in the spring. We began by calling for that action to take place, take place in the spring on March the 20th. And from now we are moving forward through this eagle sun, the sun of the summer solstice, into the events that are gonna happen on September the 21st of this year, the 2021. And the whole uh, principle of it is that to accomplish the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery, it involves the, the realization and the expression of the self-determination of the original nations of Mother Earth at a continental and a global level. And so this time, this year, the Iskali Abiyayala, we're also extending that this uprising of original nations of indigenous peoples, that it not just be limited to our continent here of the Abiyayala, but that, at, that it occur on a continuous and continuing basis periodically throughout the future generations at every market of the butterfly suns from here on into the seven generations. That is to say that at every fall equinox, as at every spring equinox, that at every turning of the cycle of the yearly cycles of the sun, that we make a geopolitical expression of self-determination as original nations, wherever we may be in any part of this mother earth. And through that, exercise of self-determination, bind, strengthen, solidarity, and uh, act collectively to realize a geopolitical agenda of self-determination in defense of 
the territorial integrity of Mother Earth. And as you must know, you do know, the primary focus, the primary purpose for engaging at this level, at the planetary level, just like the pandemic is engaged, forces to engage at the planetary level as an issue of crisis and well being and health. The same thing, except that our call is to engage at the planetary level, not only in reaction, not only in crisis, but in response, in response to bring about the realization of the self-determination of indigenous nations, of humanity, you know, as part of the ecology of the natural world, outside and beyond the constraints of the political allegiance of the states, you know, the Westphalia system of state sovereignty. So this is where we are today, um, Natalie. It's a story that has uh, come a long ways, goes still, it's, it's, go, it's bound still. We have a long ways to go. Uh, but this is a, a version, let's call it a verse of the longer story that we are still being called to fulfill. So I'll leave it there for now and let it open for a question that may be appropriate, see? Yes, thank you, Tupac. The, you do have some questions. So um, I'll, I'll read you a few questions that have come in while you've been speaking and then you can um, kind of address some of those as uh, you, you've also addressed some of them while you've been, while you've been going on. But, um, Virginia wanted to know, can you speak about the indigenous peoples and how we finally got our human rights in the United Nations and how it's connected with the doctrine of discovery? Can you also distinguish between self-determination and sovereignty? There's um, another question by Nikos, and I'll just read you a few and you can uh, go from there. But regarding uh, sovereignty rights in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I understand that the draft uh, UN DRIP asserted more collective sovereignty rights for indigenous and Aboriginal peoples and had stronger provisions for self-determination than the final version adopted by the UN in 2007. How do you see this going forward? Is there any move to amend this document or other covenants and declarations upon which it is based? So um, is there any movement to obtain the right to secede from a state that contains it holding it captive? And um, one other question uh, that I think you also wanted to talk about tonight was um, the intersection between, uh, you started talking a little bit about uh, the I-10 here in Phoenix and how that's something that um, really, uh, with no prior consultation, right, to the original peoples, to the founding peoples of this land, um, how do you see that playing out um, as part of neocolonialism um, in different areas? You know, how do you see that as uh, the, at the center of indigenous and environmental struggles currently. Um, I know I think you were gonna talk about the US-Mexico-Canada uh, Mexico agreement and how the USMCA is impacting that as well. Um, and then I think that's it you have so far from now. Uh, from Mexico, Tulen Sequitoa Moyolo, Edward. Well, let's, let's first of all uh, acknowledge something, you know, first of all. Uh, the questions in reference to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The content uh, for this webinar, we sent a link out with some references of content and links to information sources to, to address the substance of these questions. And what we're going to do after this webinar is we're going to make those uh, 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 communications of content uh, on these questions available on a permanent basis on a blog that we've installed that's a permanent blog to address uh, the process is called Indigenous Peoples Forum on the impact of the doctrine of discovery. No? But to get to the issue of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the context and the connotation that it provides for our conversation today, one of the clarifications that we would make first of all is that there is absolutely no guarantee that there's even going to be a United Nations in 50 years. It's a geopolitical structure that was created about 50 years ago, 60 or 70 years ago. Prior to that was the League of, it was the League of Nations. No? And it exists today as a reflection of the Westphalian system of state sovereignty 
that was designed in Europe, no? After the fall of the Roman Empire. And today, that system of state sovereignty, which has become transcribed now into, and sub subsumed under the corporate regimes that only use the systems of state sovereignty as, as mechanisms to institute and exploit the expropriation and exploitation of the natural resources, no? The systems of state sovereignty are also now subservient now to the trade agreements and trade arrangements that are operating at the higher levels beyond the systems of state sovereignty itself. No? So to answer the question about the, uh, the context of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we would ask you to review and read the excellent publication by our sister Charmaine Whitebase which we provided the link to in the content of how distributed with this blog, which talks about uh, indigenous rights and the balance and how the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was subverted in its original intent and purpose and language to instead of being a mechanism to advance the Declaration, the rights of indigenous peoples on a basis of non-discrimination and self-determination beyond the constraints of the system of the states it's being, sub, it's being subverted and reinterpreted to become only the, uh, a, a document of bureaucratic reference, not an international human rights standard. The one thing that we would say that we, we think is imperative to clarify, the one thing that the Declaration does, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples does do, it establishes Indigenous peoples as peoples, which never was the standard before, was never articulated before the principle of equality, that indigenous peoples as peoples are equal to all other peoples. By doing that, the declaration, just on that one single point, by doing that, the indigenous peoples, reference as equal to all other peoples, with that affirmation, with that articulation, the right of equality also must be applied now to the principle of decolonization and to the protocols for decolonization and to the exercise of the right of self-determination as peoples equal to all of the peoples. And the reference for that, as you know, didn't exist when the UN was first created. It came about in 1960 when Africa, the African countries were going through the decolonization process and as a result, the UN was forced to modify and created for the first time the right of self-determination as a right of uh, all human beings under UN Resolution 1514. That was in 1960, but it wasn't until the UN Declaration in 2007 that that term of peoples was ascribed to us and we were included in the principle of equality of also having the right of self-determination equal to all other peoples within the UN system. Our argument has been, we've been equal all along. The only reason why that equality hasn't been cognitively, cognitively recognized and acknowledged has been because of the zombie doctrines like the doctrine of discovery, the colonization and the, white, the supremacy principles of cultural supremacy and white supremacy that have dominated uh, our relationship in the states, particularly in this continent. Huh? So you mentioned the issue of the US MCA, you know, the US Mexico Canada Trade Agreement. And again, we would refer you to the materials of content that we have tied to this broadcast for further discussion and conversation about how we are taking those cam campaigns forward towards a process of affirmation of our right of self-determination, in particular when it comes to the commercial agreements among the states and the corporate entities that operate within those contexts of licenses of the states. And here's where we would uh, ask for a clarification once again. You know that at certain points in the history of uh, the relationship with the, the Vatican and the Vatican state and the Catholic church different popes that have come about over the past 500 years. But the one that's in the Vatican now, Pope Francis, has made articulations, made statements regarding the relationship of the Catholic Church and the Vatican towards the indigenous peoples. You also know that at this point, the extractive industries that are creating the most damage 
throughout all of the continent, in the north, it's Canada, that are under these trade agreements, literally engaged in open outright campaigns of, uh, uh, of, of uh, assassinations of the indigenous leaders who are fighting against the extractive mega development projects across the board from Canada through, through to Argentina, uh, the whole continent. That the fact that none of these corporations when they go to get their license from the government of Canada, when they go to get their license from the government of Chile or Argentina or Brazil or Colombia or Peru, those government entities, when they allocate those licenses for those concessions to those mining operations, to those oil, uh, those petrol, petrochemical uh, corporations, none of those licenses would have any validity at all if the doctrine of discovery wasn't providing the theological, the, the historical, justification for those states to consider themselves as an authority on this uh, question of jurisdiction uh, in this continent. So here's the break point. The UN says all peoples have the right of self-determination. In 2007, they say indigenous peoples are equal to all of the peoples. So what we ask now in this webinar, in the dismantling, we're at the critical point of asking if we're peoples equal to all of the peoples, if colonization is illegal for all peoples, how are indigenous peoples going to move through a decolonization process at the international level to exercise and realize to have a right of self-determination recognized, respected, and that there be mechanisms for the protection of that self-determination and the rights of self-determination. And when those rights are violated, there are also effective mechanisms to make the corrective actions, like we said in the beginning. And what we say, until 2007, we never had the possibility of being a corpus, to be a habeas corpus in that case. Because until we were recognized as peoples in 2007 in the Declaration, we weren't a corpus in international law to be the subject of the right of self-determination within that system. I'm not saying that we didn't have the right, but I'm saying that the system wasn't competent enough to acknowledge it. I'm not saying that it's competent now. I'm saying that that's where we're at right now in terms of the fight of self-determination of indigenous nations in regards to the UN system. But at the same time, repeating what we're saying, our self-determination is never going to emanate from that system. It's going to emanate and originate and emerge from our relationship based on our responsibilities to our traditional territories and with our traditional territories, with our original nations, through our relationship to each other as original nations in confederacy and nationhood, not necessarily statehood. Thank you, Tupac. Um, I think to just to add to some of the questions that you've been getting, um, how can we include the issue of dismantling the doctrine of discovery in the efforts to dismantle statues of native genociders and slaveholders. And uh, I know you've already shared and will be sharing for all the folks that are on um, and didn't have a chance to receive the documents that we sent out, we'll be sharing them again and make those available again. Um, but do you, what other books do you recommend or what readings would you suggest uh, to learn more about the doctrine of this discovery? There's some, there's some fundamental pieces of work that are out there that would be recommended and highly recommended. For example, uh, Steve Newcomb's work, The Pagans in the Promised Land, is a very in-depth uh, presentation. There's a lot of work that has been done in the South that is not that well known. As a matter of fact, it's one of the areas of work that is yet to be done and to which we would ask the Lawyers Guild to, to consider participating. When the United Nations in 2010 this is a fundamental piece of the, of the documentation that has been made available. We took the fight into the UN and we were successful in 2010 at the UN permanent form of having our sister Tanya Gonella Krishna as a representative of the North American region in the UN permanent form on indigenous issues in, um, in authoring and bringing into the, uh, to the permanent form a study, a preliminary study on the impact of the doctrine of discovery. The preliminary study that was produced at the UN by the author of Tanya Ganella was a preliminary study that was intended to be expounded and expanded regionally, continentally, and globally 
on how that was a continuing issue and a violation of the human rights of indigenous peoples, again, at the continental, regional, local, and global levels. No? Preliminary study. The study that was done in 2010, and a lot of the work that's been done in terms of the study of the doctor discovery here in the North has been focusing on the case of the Johnson versus McIntosh, where in 1932 was decided by the US Supreme Court that the doctrine of discovery was, this, was the fundamental law of property rights in the concept and cultural construct of the United States of America. That was in 1832, I believe. The other part of it that has to be known is that the same time in the same year, the doctrine of discovery was extrapolated by the same government continentally under the Monroe Doctrine. No? After the Monroe Doctrine, no king from Europe was allowed to come in and knock on the door and say, I'm going to plant my back. The, the, the doctrine of discovery and the hegemony of the royal crowns of Europe, the door was shut to that period. And instead, Uncle Sam took charge of the whole rancho, from the Rancho Grande of the North, and, North and set up a system of hegemony geopolitical continentally that came to be known as the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. I think that's the date. Though. So it's important to acknowledge that the doctrine of discovery and its interconnection with the Monroe Doctrine of 1843. The Monroe Doctrine is an extrapolation continentally of the domestic version of the doctrine of discovery that was instituted at the Supreme Court with the Johnson versus McIntosh decision you know, and the Marshall Trilogy you know, that, that correlates with it. And in that battle, that's why it became very evident for us, to us, that if we're going to effectively engaged with the doctrine of discovery and the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery. Again, this goes to the question of how the dismantling is gonna take place, how it has to take place, how it's been taking place, how it is taking place. If it's going to happen, we have to stand together continentally. The indigenous nations within the bounds of the US construct can't do it alone. The, the indigenous nations north of the medicine line in Canada they can't do it alone. The indigenous pueblos within the construct of the state of the Republic of Me no, Mexico, Colombia, no one can take the case forward on it. We have to stand together collectively, coherently, and bring forward our argument continentally. And that's what we're at strategically. To do that, it took us this first 30 years to build the organizational and, and cultural relationships based on our spiritual spirituality, the values of our spirituality as defenders of Mother Earth and well-being, to so set in place the platform that we now have that this webinar is evidence of. We're now ready to go into the next step, to move forward strategically, coherently, continentally, to accomplish the doctrine of discovery among ourselves first. We have to do that first among ourselves. How are we going to do that? It's a very simple answer that at times seems so difficult. How are we as the original nations of Abiyayala? I didn't say America. We have to start there. We have to stop and drop that concept of America as a determinant for our identity. We can't do that if we're going to dismantle the doctrine. We can't do that. We have to use our own nomenclature, our own name, our own voice, our own language, our own prayers, our own ceremonies, our own spirituality to invoke the responsibility that are going to bring us together to defend Mother Earth, to defend our part of Mother Earth, this continent, to accomplish that dismantling. If we are going to dismantle the doctrine of discovery continentally, and again, we're focusing on this continent, we have to be a we. We have to have a geopolitical cultural construct that is going to unite us culturally so that we can emerge geopolitically with a common geopolitical agenda of self-discrimination and liberation. We have that. We didn't have that in 84. We didn't have that in 1990. We didn't have it in 93. But through the five continental summits, and now this year, the 2020, we're ready to take it to the next level in the exercise of that right, the responsibility of being the defenders of territorial integrity of Mother Earth in this continent of Abiyayala. Just to close, what I would say, Natalie, we keep using that term, the territorial integrity of Mother Earth, because you mentioned the declaration the UN Declaration. You know that the fatal flaw that was included in that declaration as a result of the insistence of the states to pass it on the floor of the General Assembly, they demanded and they commanded, they commanded 
that the territorial integrity of the state should not be violated in the exercise of the right of self-determination of indigenous peoples equal to all other peoples, all right? That's where that question of secession comes in. They think it's a question of secession. But how can you secede from something that you were never part of in the beginning? You know? We're simply saying this. The government states that the UN system are built on the principle of being defenders of the territorial integrity of states. When Putin went into the Ukraine, he violated that and he's gotten away with it. He's getting, he's getting away with it now. And we'll close with one point that he's doing at the end, but the territorial integrity of, of the states is the mechanism that has been used as a justification to keep the right of indigenous self-determination within the bounds of the domestic constraints of the states. For that reason, they have tried to take the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from being a international human rights instrument that was going to move from a declaration to a United Nations Convention on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And they tried to ratchet it down and reduce it, just like the Spaniards did with their reducciones, to simply being a normative framework domestically within each country, so that every country will only interpret the declaration according to limitations and standards and qualifications no, of their national constitutions. That's what Canada is doing. That's what Mexico is doing. That's what Colombia is doing. Every continent in this con every country in this continent is taking the declaration of domestic union instead of uh, allowing for the declaration to provide the, the standard being frame standard making framework geopolitically continentally to move towards a convention on the rights of indigenous people. So coming out, the states stand on territorial integrity of states as a non-viable, non-violatable standard within the system of the UN, although Putin violated and he's been getting away with it, with the Ukraine. What do we stand on? It's already been determined by consensus, by consensus at the United Nations, at the, at the world, uh, at the global caucus of indigenous women, at the global caucus of indigenous peoples, it would determine our presence in the geopolitical system of the world as it stands now, today, not just 1492 or 1984, all of these today, our stand in the geopolitical community of humanity worldwide, talking about the, the, the pandemic thing, not in terms of a crisis, but a, an opportunity for us to move forward. We stand as original nations of Mother Earth in defense of not the territorial integrity of the states, but the territorial integrity of Mother Earth in a holistic, planetary, geopolitical framework of self-determination that doesn't derive from their system of jurisdiction, their system of jurisprudence. It derives from our Jewish genesis of being the original nations of Mother Earth from time immortal, from time immemorial, from our systems of jurisprudence, our traditional legal systems of our own making, including our own international legal systems, which was the subject of our presentation here at the beginning of the hour. And from that, we have reaffirmed and reassured, even in spite of the violence and the genocide that has been waged upon us, our jurisdiction, our responsibilities in our territories, as we move forward towards the judgment of defending Mother Earth, the sacredness of Mother Earth, for the well being of the future generations. In the same way that the pandemic has been inflicted upon us as an infliction and a virus that is causing the destruction and death to which there is the aspiration and the hope for a virus, I mean, excuse me, for a vaccine. There's no vaccine against the doctrine of discovery. It's a psychological pathology, pathology pathogen, and there's no vaccine for it. It has to be eliminated. It has to be brought to an end. It can't be reformed. Genocide cannot be reformed. Colonization cannot be reformed. It has to be ended. The zombie doctrine, the doctrine of discovery, has to go the way of history. And once we have gone through the process of dismantling it, we're going to get to the next level, which is going to happen in September of this year, the dawn of September the 22nd. Geopolitically, we're going to uprise continentally and globally. And we're going to achieve something that we have yet to fully comprehend the magnitude, the superseding of the doctrine of discovery. It's still going to be there. It's going to be in the law books of the states. It's going to be in the history books of their educational systems. But if we rise with enough power, strength, and truth, and 
our spirituality as the guide, we're going to achieve the superseding of the doctrine of discovery. We're similar to how, well, for a long time, the Catholic Church had the dogma of the terracentric version of the universe. They don't teach that anymore. That was the dogma. They made Galileo renounce his observations and say, the sun uh, is going around the earth. No, the church doesn't do, they, they rejected that dogma and no longer hold it. They superseded the dogma of the terracentric version of the earth. Now more people are familiar with the earth growing around the sun, a heliocentric version of the cosmos. Huh? But what we are saying now, neither, neither terracentric nor heliocentric. What we understand is that the universe is in motion. For us as the Navathaka, it's an incantation. The sky song, the mother earth, the drumbeat, the drumbeat of mother earth, the sky song of father sky. And within that jurisdiction, as part of that jurisdiction, we call now for the re-emergence and the regeneration of our powers as original nations of the planet, beyond the constraints of the declaration, beyond the constraints of the world system, using them to the degree that they might be viable, that they might be uh, strategic, but not being limited to the systems, and re-emerge as original nations of the whole planet towards the reaffirmation and the defense of the territorial, the defense of territorial integrity of the Mother Earth. And we call that, now we call that, as of this day, today, we call that the superseding of the doctrine of discovery. We're going to go beyond it. We're going to create a context beyond that of colonization and genocide into healing and into the well being for the future generations of all of the life forms of Mother Earth, not just the human being. So Tupac, you do have a couple of more questions. I don't know if uh, you still want to take those questions or you want to wrap up. Um, we are an hour and 15. Um, we've kind of given, you know, about 20, 30 minutes for questions. So I'll leave it up to you. Um, you have, you'll take them. Okay. So the questions you have, and also Vicki McLellan has her hand raised. Um, I'm not sure if she wants to speak um, and she was on cue. So if, if that's the case. And so does Susan Scott. Okay, hands went down. All right. Um, from Leland Castleberry, what is your relationship with the Hawaiian sovereignty movement? Um, from David Alvarez, what can we use to bind us on socioeconomic level for continental self-determination? What role does the work of people like Alex Whiteplume have in relation to geopolitical relations? And from Susan Scott, just a comment. Um, if you can comment on uh, if there's a relationship with Palestine and also greetings from the Haudenosaunee territory. There's, um, there's going to be made available uh, through the connections, uh, the, uh, the email system that was set up to launch this Zoom. There's going to be made available a link to the blog we run all of this information um, in a constant process to move the uh, dismantling of the doctrine of discovery forward. Huh? One of the things that you can do is simply that, is that whenever you come into a conversation on the doctrine of discovery, always put in front of that the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery. Never allow any longer the doctrine of discovery to remain as a norm, as a standard that goes without question. It must be questioned at every turn, and it must begin internally. You know? it must begin begin to extract the internalized versions of the doctrine of discovery that's become socialized and normalized within our own families and communities. You know? We have to decolonize ourselves. When we first went to the United Nations in 1987, the United Nations um, uh, Human Rights Commission, we arrived there. We had these same questions in mind. What is this? How is this going to lead? How is it going to contribute? Where is this going to fit with our struggle for self-determination? And we were instructed by the Palestinians at that point. We heard them invoking the principle of self-determination. We heard them invoking UN Resolution 1514. And we went to them for advice and for instruction. And they broke it down to us. They said, if you're going to come here, what are you going to come here for? Why are you coming here? If you're going to fight for self-determination, why aren't you talking about how the United States 
had to report to the decolonization committee up until 1960 on the issue of Alaska and Hawaii. Because up until 1960, the United States had to go to the UN and report to the UN decolonization committee on how they were moving Alaska and Hawaii towards self-determination, which there was only the three options were available within the system. Those are still the only three. We see that the one we're talking about here, the territorial integrity of Mother Earth, that's number four, it's not on the list. It's the one that we're gonna realize. But up until 1960, the United States had to report to the UN under 1514, UN Resolution 1514, 1541, how they were moving those territories, non-self-governing territories, towards self-determination because colonization is a crime. So the Palestinians clued us to it. They told us to look at what was happening with Hawaii, with Alaska, and we did that. We began to extrapolate that about what was happening here in what is known as the greater Southwest, the territories that have been uh, bisected by the international border of the Republic of Mexico and Canada. We began to apply those principles of UN 15 and UN 1514, the right of self-determination, the violation of that right on how the government system of the Mexico and of the United States and now Canada with the USMCA are being used as infrastructures of neo-colonialism, the neoliberal economic regimes. They're not coming at us with vice royalties of New Spain. They're not coming at us with colonies chartered by the Queen of England or from Canada, the right of Canada, they still have that. They're coming at us with trade zones. They're coming at us with NA, NAFTA, the new NAFTA, the USMCA. They're using the economic mechanisms of trade agreements among themselves to recolonize, to neocolonize under the neoliberalism, the privatization of the resources that are being uh, dealt out under the justification of the, of, the, of the certificates of fraud that are coming from the, the states themselves. No? So the point being that to engage internationally on the fight against colonization, the fight against neocolonialism, neo neo we also have to engage with all of our other allies strategically across the planet. The Palestinians were there at the beginning. They're still with us now. And our relatives in the self-determination movement, sometimes called the sovereignty movement of our relatives in Hawaii, is a strategic part of the overall strategy, as is the fight in the North, as is the fight in Mexico right now at the present moment, because of the uh, framework that has been imposed upon us, has been accelerated at the present moment in the present Accelerated, accelerated version of colonization that has been brought to bear under the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, which ask yourself this, were you consulted? Were you consulted prior? Were you given the right of consultation or were you given the right to deny consent in terms of that U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement? And if you can answer that question, we have a conversation to take place because right now we're challenging the U.S. government, the Mexican government and the Canadian government on the violation of the right of self-determination, on the violation of the right of free prior and informed consent as it's articulated in the declaration in terms of the context of that trade agreement. And we need to move forward on that issue. And in order to do that, again, the fundamental point, to do that, we have to be a we. We can't be Canadian Indians. We can't be North American Indians of Native America. We can't be Los Indios, the Pueblo de United de Mexico. We have to be our own people relationship with each other in a geopolitical context and construct of our own making. And we have that in place. Now it's time to exercise it and bring it to bear in the geopolitical arena, regionally, locally, regionally, continentally, and globally. And to that end, I will, um, Eileen, if you'd like to speak, um, I can allow you, I'm just unmuting your, um, your microphone. So you can speak if you'd like to in um, person. You just need to unmute yourself as well. Okay, I guess that's not working, but Eileen did say, um, Sun 21 Koyukon Athabasca, Alaska is in Unity Inc. largest 
oldest native youth group on Turtle Island. Today holds annual virtual conference with diverse tribal youth, 14 to 24. In July, they have two more sessions, including workshops. Perhaps you would like to tape a decolonization, dismantling doctrine workshop about a half an hour for these youth. That's just an idea. A response. What I would suggest is that we mention the two continental encounters, 1919-1993. We mentioned the five summits. You must know that at the fifth summit in, in Colombia, 2013, there was a continental indigenous women's summit that took place ahead of, ahead of the full summit. And there was also a continental indigenous youth summit that took place ahead of time. There is such a thing as the continental indigenous youth movement that is tied to this process of self-determination and uh, a reaffirmation of our responsibilities. The language border, the language barrier does not apply to us. It's a challenge, but it doesn't apply to us in terms of original nations and Confederacy continental. And we have to, that's one of the major impacts of the doctrine of discovery that has separated us into indigenous peoples of the North and the South speak in English or Blanda Espanol, or in Brazil they speak Portuguese, no? Uh, maybe up there in Alaska, you guys might talk Russian, I don't know. We know some of the folks speak French up there, further north. But again, those are not the frames of our systems of communication continentally. The frames of our system of continentally are what we're going to invoke at dawn on September the 22nd, continentally. And the butterflies of the Iskali Ariayala, we invite you, not just for half an hour webinar or a workshop, we invite you to take your place in the continental indigenous uprising that is bound to take place, will be taking place at dawn. Of September the 22nd, the butterfly sound of the fall equinox at the continental level. We'll talk about the webinar, we're available. For any contributions, we also extend the invitation to join up in some manner at some point, maybe in September, with the, the continental indigenous youth movement, which is accompanying this process throughout the whole time. Okay, I think those are all the questions that you've got, uh, Tupac. I know that this topic, um, you know, for everyone that tuned in today, thank you so much for, for um, tuning in and, and Tupac for being with us. It has, um, it's the start of a conversation and it's really meant to be the very beginning of a conversation and it's a long process of decolonization and it's not just something that happens overnight. It's something that each one of us, I mean, there's, there's a mental component, a spiritual component, a physical component um, and really education is a huge part of that. So um, thank you so much Tupac for sharing so much of your knowledge with us uh, tonight and helping us to deconstruct, uh, you know, some of the boxes and the legal boxes that we've uh, had to um, fit into uh, a lot of us that are lawyers. Um, I know that that's kind of a constant for myself, you know, trying to think outside of that box and think past that. Um, I think the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was like an example of beginning to do that. Um, and it was Indigenous centered and it was led by Indigenous peoples. But um, even that process is something that's still lacking, right? And as you said, it was something that they included, had to include that little part, you know, it's it, it reaffirming the domestic dependent nation um, that's a part of federal Indian law here in the United States or what's known as the United States or that colonial territory, this colonial territory, but um, it was replicated almost through that document, um, you know, worldwide through the, through the UN system. Um, but there's, there's a lot to be done. So this, um, we're hoping that, you know, other, other panels that we'll have in the future, we hope to have you back, uh, Tupac, and we hope to have uh, this be the beginning of many different conversations on this topic, which um, is just so extensive, so. I have two things I want to share real quickly, you know, at the close. First of all, uh, my sincere appreciation and gratitude for your attention and patience. Uh, and I would like to mention uh, two things I think are very important timely. One is that tomorrow, the 26th of June, is going to be five years and nine months since the 43 students of Ayotzinapa have been missing without their parents knowing where they are, what happened to them. And we know that the gentleman from uh, the Department of Justice in Mexico, 
was responsible for the cover-up of the false narrative that was presented by the previous administration in Mexico, Mr. Tomas Heron, is hiding out in Canada. And we know if there's any folks here on the call who are in Canada or from that part of the Canadian side of the medicine line, we want you to consider issuing a declaration of persona non grata that the Canadian government is allowing Tomas Heron the, there's a warrant for his arrest out in Mexico, and supposedly there's a red flag notice out for him on Interpol, from Interpol to be arrested for his complicity in, in the cover up, in the criminal cover up of the forced disappearance of the 43 IU Atinapa students tomorrow is the anniversary of five years and nine months. We ask you to take action. None of this information, none of this consciousness uh, is really worth very much at all. If anything, we don't take action on it. So we ask you to do that as part of your action of dismantling the doctor of scrubbing. Don't let what happens to the indigenous peoples in Mexico be disregarded and diminished just because they're south of the borderline that was established by the doctrine of discovery and its corollary states. Don't let the doctrine divide us. It's a zombie doctrine, no? remember that. The other part I would remind you too is that we had a conversation about five months ago about how many deaths at the front lines of the indigenous movement have been taking place in North America over the past year. We talk about the 2,500 deaths during the pandemic here in Arizona we know that the Navajo Nation is suffering the highest per capita percentage of deaths because of that. We know that the farm workers in the Yuma area right now, where the spike is the most severe or the most vulnerable to the pandemic right now, and those are indigenous people coming up from Mexico to work in the field. That's us, no? So that's another dimension of the, the doctrine would never work if there wasn't dehumanization already established. The dehumanization process is how the doctrines are become normalized because they're doctrines of dehumanization. They're doctrines of death, they're zombie doctrines. So we ask you to keep that in mind because when we ask the question, how many indigenous peoples at the front lines in the region of North America, in the region of the US, Mexico, Canada trade agreement, how many of them have lost their lives for being at the front lines of the fight over the natural resources and territory and defenses? The numbers that come up are stark. In Canada, in the US, they're stark. But when you take the numbers in Mexico, over the past year, we've lost almost two dozen. I'm going to say it again. We've lost almost two dozen people assassinated, assassinated, assassinated in Mexico for being at the front lines of the fight, such as the cases going on in Tarzan, as the cases going on across Canada, Wet'suwet'en, you no, know, over here in Standing Rock. All of these fights are all interconnected and we have to fight connected. Why? Because think of this. When Barack Obama put the block on the Trans Canada, the Keystone, it was blocked for a time. What did Trans Canada do? What did TC Energy do? In that interval between the block by Obama and when D. Trump gave him the fast track approval during the, during the Dakota, uh, 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 the, 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 the Sandy Rock standoff, in that interval, TC Canada, Trans Canada, moved into Mexico and built the first private pipelines in Mexico in that interval to maintain that profit margin. So who stood up against TC, Can TC Energy Trans Canada in Mexico? It was our people. And they stopped them and blocked them. But why are no, those two fights connected if it's the same corporation doing the same thing to us? We can't allow the borders of the doctrine of discovery as state sovereignty systems to buy our fight and constrict our fight to frameworks that are not going to work strategically to our advantage and still going to release, reduce us to fighting within a, a field of battle that they have defined. We can't allow them to define the field of battle if we expect to engage and come out victorious in the struggle. That's why we use the term and concept of territory, integrity, mother earth time and time again, because we're not going to move from there. That's who we are. That's what we are. And that's why our responsibility lies. I don't know. I mentioned at the beginning that there was a gentleman called um, Mr. Begay, J. D. L. Begay, Kokopa. Four years ago, he stood up before a man called D. Trump. D. Trump was just here this past week. He told D. Trump what I'm gonna tell you right now. He told D. Trump, this is when he was a candidate. D. Trump, you're being disrespectful. When he used that term, Pocahontas, you're talking about Senator Elizabeth, you're being disrespectful, not just to Senator Warren, you're being disrespectful to us. 
for all of us as indigenous peoples. And we, the Kokopa, the indigenous, we're not going to put up with it. You're going to have to stop doing that. D. Trump told J. Deal Begay, vice chairman of the Kokopa tribe, who passed away this past Saturday, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm not going to do that no more. Now ask yourself this. Has he done that? Has he kept his word? Has he stopped using that term of racial derision of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, I, I, I can, it's hard for me to describe. And the reason I make it known because Mr. Begay, Mr. J. Deal Begay, he passed away from the coronavirus, from complications of the coronavirus this past Saturday. So when we began this program, we started in Bokeh, the spirits of our ancestors and relatives have passed away as a result of this current virus. But you must know, we know that. For us in particular, we're talking like 20, 25 million people over the course of the last 500 years. Continentally, it's something like 50, 60, up to 70, 80 million people who have passed away as a result of the viruses, the pathogens, the pandemics that were introduced in our continent as a result of our lack of immunity to those diseases that were brought as a result of the colonization and the genocide that came with the imposition of the doctrine of the struggle, you know? the dehumanization of the doctrine of the struggle. So I say that to you to recall once again and ask you to consider to keep those folks in your, in your memory as I know you are, you know, as I know you will, and let's move forward together as a, in a confederacy of indigenous nations or relations of Mother Earth towards the defense of the territorial integrity of Mother Earth and the well-being of future generations. Thank you so much, Tupac. Uh, thank you again for, for being here tonight with us. And thank you to everyone that was, um, that tuned in. We will make the video um, recording available at some point in the future. Um, for those that might also be interested in seeing it in Spanish, uh, we're, we'll probably be either closed captioning it or providing some sort of translation for that as well. Um, regarding just, uh, you know, access to um, some of the documents that um, Tupac has been mentioning, I did include them in the chat, so please check that. Um, but we'll also send it out again to all of those that signed up um, for the webinar and that actually attended. So thank you again, um, Tupac, muchísimas gracias. We really um, are looking forward to having you back again. And um, for those that were in attendance, this is the first in a four part series on uh, indigenous peoples and environmental human rights. Uh, the next one will be with uh, Professor Andy Reed from uh, Colorado. He's from the Vednanta, Vednanda International and Comparative Law Center. Um, who, will, who will be speaking on earth rights and indigenous sovereignty uh, in an international human rights framework. And um, two weeks after that, on July 23rd, we will have another um, panel that um, I'm really looking forward to as well. It's a, a panel of indigenous women that are leading um, a lot of the struggle against extractive industry. So we'll have uh, Lola Cowboy from the Water Protector Legal Collective, uh, Michelle Cook, uh, from Divest and Best Protect, and who um, is leading a lot of the divestment work, uh, Leona Morgan on uranium mining, and uh, someone from our relatives to the south, from the YU people in Colombia, Jacqueline Romero de Piayu, who's a, uh, an indigenous woman and leader, um, and has spoken extensively on um, access to water and the uh, impact of mining um, in Colombia. So again, thank you so much, uh, Tupac. Buenas noches para ti. Thank you. And Pleasure. everybody, uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Adios. Good night, everybody. Hasta pronto. And yes, we'll send the schedule of speakers to everybody. Thank you.